Well into the fourth year of the COVID-19 pandemic, intense political and scientific debate about its origins continues. I'm Stephen Morrissey, Managing Editor of the New England Journal of Medicine, and I'm talking with Lawrence Gostin, Faculty Director of the O'Neill Institute for National and Global Health Law at Georgetown University Law Center. Professor Gostin has co-authored a perspective article about investigations into the origins of SARS-CoV-2 and steps for protecting against future pandemics, regardless of their source. Professor Gostin, could you start by explaining the two major hypotheses about the origins of the COVID-19 pandemic? Yes, of course. Thank you. The first major hypothesis is a natural zoonotic spillover, most likely occurring at the Hunan wet market in Wuhan, China. The other theory is that there was a laboratory leak based in a laboratory that's located in Wuhan and close to the market. What kinds of data have been available to investigate each of those hypotheses, and what pieces of evidence do you think are still missing? Let me begin, if I may, Steve, by saying that we don't have the evidence that we should have after four long years of a pandemic, as you aptly pointed out in your introduction. The world is yearning to know, and we deserve to know, with all of the suffering we've had, what caused it. But there's been a distinct lack of transparency. Chinese government closed down the Wuhan market very early on, after the initial outbreak was detected, and they've thwarted the World Health Organization's attempts to have full access both to the laboratory and to the market in wider Hubei province where the outbreak took place and the Southern Bat Caves. And so we don't know all we should, but this is what we do know. In support of the laboratory leak, which we think is a low likelihood, but we can't unequivocally rule it out, is the fact that it's located near the point of the outbreak and also that it was working with viruses that have close similarity to SARS-CoV-2, but not identical. The major evidence seems to point toward naturally occurring zoonosis. More than 60% of all novel outbreaks historically occur through natural spillovers from animals to humans. And in this case, there's some considerable evidence of it. Epidemiologically, the evidence is strong that most of the early cases seem to be around the market, and the epidemiological trail seems to emerge from the market as ground zero. Secondly, and this is more recent data, we found genetic evidence at the market itself that SARS-CoV-2 was in that market, in cages, defeathering um, machines, etc., which suggests to us that There's reasonably strong evidence of a natural spillover, but it cannot be concluded definitively. So what are the current positions of the U.S. and international agencies on the most likely origins of the virus? Do they align with those? Not quite. The World Health Organization had a joint report with China. And in that initial joint report, it did conclude that the most likely origin was a naturally occurring uh, zoonotic spillover. But the very day after that report was issued, Dr. Tedros, the director general of the World Health Organization, repudiated it and said that there wasn't enough investigation of the laboratory for him to be satisfied. He's since established SAGO, a scientific advisory committee on origins, But China has not allowed SAGO to enter the country or investigate further. And so we're at a stalemate as far as the World Health Organization is concerned. In the U.S., President Biden instructed all of our national intelligence agencies to determine what the actual origin was. I should note, and it's of concern to me, that he asked the intelligence agencies, but not the CDC, who you'd think should be front and center on this. Those intelligence agencies have split. Most of them have said that the most probable outcome is a natural zoonosis. Others have credited with low or moderate confidence that it was a laboratory leak. Most recently, President Biden issued an order declassifying those intelligence agency reports, which should illuminate a lot, but those reports have not been made public yet. And at the same time, 
Congress, particularly the Republican-controlled House of Representatives, launched investigations where the laboratory leak got a lot of credit, but I think probably from a scientific perspective, unjustifiably so. So what are the next steps for investigations into the origins? Will there be next steps? I wish I could tell you, Steve, that this is just the beginning and that we really are going to uncover the truth of the science in this. But I think it's very unlikely. It's like going back to a crime scene four years later where the entire crime scene has been scrubbed. And and indeed, we're not allowed into that crime scene. And so there really is an impasse between the Chinese government, the US government, and WHO. It's very unlikely, I think, that China is going to relent and allow the kind of truly independent and unfettered investigation that we would need. You know, this may be one of the things where history will look back with a big sigh and say, this was the greatest public health crisis of the early 21st century. And it's something that we never really knew what caused it. You said earlier that this investigation should have been strictly a scientific matter, but that in the end it wasn't. This may be a naive question, but why has this become the matter of such intense political debate, both domestically within the U.S. and then internationally? It's a beautiful question to ask. You know, on the basis of a purely rational thinking about this, there shouldn't be a political controversy. China shouldn't think that it was being attacked because the place where a virus originates doesn't mean that the country's at fault. Remember, the H1N1 influenza pandemic started in the United States and Mexico, and the U.S. actually was very transparent and cooperative with the international community and WHO. China has seen it as a point of pride. President Trump was in office at the time, and so there was really a geopolitical struggle. China ludicrously said that the United States military was responsible, which of course is zero evidence for and just has no basis. President Trump called it the Wuhan virus or the China virus, and then he pointed the finger. And in the middle of the geopolitical struggle between the two great superpowers was the World Health Organization. And at the time, something unthinkable happened. The president of the United States wrote a letter to the secretary general of the United Nations announcing the withdrawal of the United States from the World Health Organization. Uh, In the Washington Post, I had called it the most ruinous presidential decision in my lifetime, and I've lived quite a long time. And so it has become very political. The Republicans in Congress have really pointed to the laboratory leak. There have been some scientists, it should be said, that do believe that the laboratory leak is feasible and even likely, although I think that's a minority opinion. And so this continues to swirl into controversy. Politics seems to rule. Finally, you say in your article that irrespective of the origins of COVID, future outbreaks could result from deliberate, accidental, or natural causes. So given that, what approaches could help prevent future pandemics, regardless of their source? The New England Journal perspective piece was entitled, you know, why the origins of COVID matters and why it doesn't. We've talked a lot about why it matters because it'll help us be more prepared. But irrespective of the origins, we can do three things. The first thing is to adopt the One Health approach. One Health approach looks at animal health, human health, and environmental health as a linked system. And it tries to prevent zoonotic spillovers by reversing deforestation so that humans and animals are separate, by regulating wet markets, and by doing all the kinds of things that you would need to make sure that there isn't a close interchange between wild animals and human populations. WHO is currently negotiating a pandemic treaty in Geneva, and one of the important highlights of that treaty is the One Health approach. But we'll see whether this nation sign on to that. The second is that we need a lot better laboratory security and laboratory oversight to make sure that there isn't an inadvertent leak of any virus or pathogen from those laboratories. And I should mention, and it's very important, that nobody believes 
but China intentionally put out a novel coronavirus. The only allegation is that there might have been an unintentional leak. And so we need oversight. And the third thing is what's called gain-of-function research, which I know New England Journal of Medicine readers know quite a lot about. Basically, this is research that tries to enhance the pathogenicity or the transmissibility of a pathogen. Sometimes it has very good scientific reasons because we want to know about the properties of those pathogens, but sometimes it can cause an enhanced pathogen that might be released accidentally or otherwise that could cause harm. And we have insufficient oversight of -of gain-of-function research, particularly globally, because no country, not even the United States, acting alone can solve this problem. We need global solutions. So there are three things we can do right now, irrespective of the origins, to fortify our defenses when the next novel virus hits. Thank you, Professor Gostin.